morning, and welcome to this time and place of worship. A warm welcome to this joint worship service of Sydenham United and Fairview United Churches. Whether you're joining us in real time on Twitch or on Facebook or later on on Facebook or YouTube, whether you've been uh, attending our services regularly or are visiting, welcome. I'm Jennifer Canning, the minister at Fairview United, and I just thought I'd take a moment to introduce the, the team here. We've got our, our music director, Deborah Park, our dynamic duo here on, on vocals and drum, Cindy Smiley and Tom Smiley. And you won't see him, but our, our tech wizard behind the scenes, Les Atwood. Thank you for, for being here today. Just to note that uh, Sydenham Heritage's uh, minister, Reverend Paul, is on vacation this past week and for the coming week, but uh, Reverend Bill McKinnon is back from his time out east uh, for, for those who would like to contact him. And so we gather together, yet apart in worship, and as we do that, we light a candle And if you have a candle at home, I'd invite you to light it at this time as a symbol of Christ's presence here in our midst. And so let us come into worship in song. All you people, let us praise our maker, let us worship together, let us pray together, let us lift up the joys and concerns of our life, let us reflect together, and so let us pray together. Gracious God, who creates, sustains, and redeems all life, blow through the doors of our hearts, where the dust of the years covers the joy of living fully, blow it away. Where shutters are nailed down, keeping us from experiencing the light of loving fully, blow them open. Blow into our midst that we may be renewed, healed, challenged, and provoked to live the transforming power of your love in the world. Amen. Our opening hymn is Open My Eyes That I May See. It's number 371. Thank you. 
different times in our lives, we all do things that we later come to regret. We say things that hurt friends, family members, ourselves. Our prayer of confession is a chance to reflect on places in life where where we as individuals, where we as church, as society, carry brokenness and carry regret. And so let us pray. Right versus wrong, on versus off, black versus white, left versus right, us versus them. So many places in our lives we reduce to dualities. This or that. The weeds versus the wheat, so to speak. May we take a moment to pause, to reflect on those places in our lives where we are overlooking opportunities to learn, to grow, to be open to the in-between, to release the rigidity of duality, to be open to experiencing the world and each other in life-giving and love-bringing ways as we open our hearts in the silence of this moment. And so let us lift up our hearts and be reminded that while we are flawed and imperfect, We are perfectly loved and valued. May this knowledge help empower us to continue to learn and live into God's kingdom. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our family hymn today is Give Me Oil in My Lamp.
much. Turn my mic back on. For our all ages time today, we have a story to share, and we're going to move back down to the campfire for that. And so I've moved down here to our, our campfire that we've had set up for some time since uh, Camping Sunday, I guess. Although we've taken the tent down, we thought we'd continue to, to have our little campfire here. Because I have a story to share, and it's a, a story that uh, is an old Indian legend, but I'm, I'm sharing it as it was shared on Paolo Coachello's website. An Indian legend tells of a man who carried water to his village every day in two large jars tied to the ends of a wooden pole, which he balanced on his back. One of the jars was older than the other and had some small cracks. Every time the man covered the distance to his house, half of the water was lost. The younger jar was always very proud of its performance, safe in the knowledge that it was up to the mission it had been made for, while the other jar was mortified with shame at only fulfilling half of its allotted task. It was so ashamed that one day, while the man got ready to fetch water from the well, it decided to speak to him. I want to apologize, but because of the many years of service, you are only able to deliver half of my load and quench half of the thirst which awaits you at your home. The man smiled and said, when we return, observe the path carefully. And so it did. And the jar noticed that on its side, many flowers and plants grew. See how nature is more lovely on your side, commented the man. I always knew you were cracked and decided to make use of this fact. I planted flowers and vegetables and you have always watered them. I have picked many roses to decorate my house with. I have fed my children with lettuce and cabbage and onions. If you were not as you are, how could I have done that? All of us, at some point, grow old and start to acquire other qualities. We can always make the most of each one of these new qualities and obtain a good result. And so we prepare now to uh, turn the, the screen over to Sydenham Heritage and, and the folks there. We're going to be hearing two scripture readings this morning. The first is from uh, the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the Romans. And the second will um, continue. Last week we, we started off a, a series of parables of Jesus teaching to um, to the, the crowds speaking in parables, and, and we're going to hear another parable this week, another one rooted in imagery of, of soil and land and um, harvest imagery. So, so let us hear those scriptures now. Good morning. Whether you take what is written in the Bible as fact, metaphor, myth, or story, listen to these words now for the teaching they hold for you today. From Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 25. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage 
to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The second reading is from Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30 and 36 to 43. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field, but while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? And he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parables of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evil doers and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. Within these words, let us hear the word of God. Thanks be to God. Bursting forth in glorious day, 
Up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man, could ever pluck me from his hand. Let us pray. God, the words you speak have power, power to create, power to disturb, power to heal. Help us to hear your word today. Amen. I don't know if any of you ever feel this way, but sometimes I wish my life was more like it is in the movies. I mean, for one thing, I would have a much cooler car, electric, of course. And I'm really drawn to the idea that whatever problem you're facing in life, it'll be resolved in a couple of hours. <clears throat> but the main reason I wish some days wish my life was in the movies is because we can tell the difference between good and evil easily. For example, even back in the 1939 movie The Wizard of Oz, knowing who is good and who is evil is very simple. I mean, Think back to when you saw that movie, and hands up all of you who knew instinctively that Glinda the Good was good without even being told. Hands up all of you who knew that the Wicked Witch of the West was evil, again without actually being told. The morality in the Wizard of Oz story is strikingly blatant and binary. When Dorothy left canvas, the film changed from black and white to color but at the same time, the morality switched from color to black and white. In the land of Oz, good is good and evil is evil. Although I do suppose we were actually a bit misled about the wizard himself. We were led to believe he was an amazing person, only to discover he was a nobody. Oh, I, I hope I didn't spoil the ending for anyone. But with the exception of the wizard and Dorothy, both of whom are human visitors who don't belong anyway. In the land of Oz, good and evil are very easy to figure out. Today's gospel text is a lot like that too. The players in the parable are divided into two very distinct groups, good, evil. Personally, I find that makes the story a bit harder to understand. There are just too many references to things I can't embrace. Or maybe I just don't get it. I cannot embrace a God who would pitch people in the trash. I don't understand how God decides not to intervene in human affairs until the end days, but the devil is free to interfere at will. I can't understand why good people should suffer because God refuses to act now on our behalf. And I don't see how justice deferred is justice at all. In the words of Gary Lash Delashmut, does it bother you, sorry, quote, does it bother you that Jesus distills all of humanity into two groups? Does it offend you that he names these two groups, the descendants of the kingdom and the descendants of the evil one? What a simplistic and bigoted description. 
Here is Jesus, the binary bigot, who desperately needs diversity training. End quote. If you have troubles with the notion of an apocalyptic God, you're not alone. The notion that I might be a child of the devil and sent to the fires of eternity is not very compelling, to say the least. I'm very grateful myself this parable is only found in the Gospel of Matthew and not in the other Gospels. And it relieves me that most biblical scholars consider this parable to be the words of an early Christian community, not the words of Jesus. But even at that, what is this parable about? I think the fog of strangeness in this text lifts a little bit when we recall Matthew's basic take on the whole Jesus project. Although the early Jesus venture was made up of different groups, including Jewish and non-Jewish people, scholars pretty much agree that Matthew was written to an exclusively Jewish community. For Matthew, Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. And Matthew takes Jesus and inserts him into a particular role in what was called Jewish apocalypticism. This was a belief system in which God would intervene and bring ultimate justice to the world at the end of an age. In Matthew's mind, Jesus was God's tool in making this happen. Matthew's text today actually gives a pretty good overview of the whole idea of apocalypticism. But the short version is that God creates us all, good and evil things happen to us for a while, and then later on God comes and produces a final victory for the good guys, and the bad guys are sent to hell. Simple. Paul's message in, re in Romans reinforces this apocalyptic notion. Paul refers to this unbelievable inheritance we can expect, which is an allusion to this apocalyptic future. Paul instructs us to welcome the delay as a pregnant woman welcomes her pregnancy. I think from this it's safe to conclude Paul was never pregnant himself. But anyway, Paul clearly sees in other places Paul talks about the benefits of living a spiritual life in the present. But he too looks for this great apocalyptic future. <clears throat> but the parable has more to it than just apocalyptic expectations. If we try to remove the apocalyptic elements that many people struggle to appreciate today, I think we're still left with an important message. So here's how I look at it. The parable has three phases. In the first phase, the farmer plants seed and the evil one plants weeds. Well, this phase presumably refers to a time long before you and I were born. In the last phase, the harvesting and the punishment come. This phase presumably refers to a time long after you and I are dead. But in the middle phase, we have the wheat and the weeds, weeds growing together. We have a mixture of good and evil. We have variability, we have variety, we have creativity, we have vitality, we have life. In other words, this is the phase where we come into the story ourselves. We are the ones who live in a reality of a world where good and evil coexist. According to some scholars, the weeds in the parable are not just any old weeds. They are bearded darnel, which is a species of ryegrass common in Palestine. What is interesting about these weeds is that when they sprout and they start to grow, they look just like wheat. The Darnell looks exactly like wheat until a certain point in their maturation, when the heads fill, and then the difference between the wheat and the weeds becomes obvious. But before that stage is reached, you just cannot tell the difference between the weeds and the wheat. To quote a blogger who goes by the name Blooming Cactus, Quote, the problem with taking our hoe to the evil weeds of the world is that good and evil sometimes look so much alike, it only becomes clear later. End quote. As you're aware, I'm sure this parallels our own history. We often cannot easily separate good from evil in the present. I mean, here are three simple examples. I've read enough about residential schools to realize that most of the teachers who worked in the schools, when this whole thing started, thought it was a good idea. But obviously it grew into a situation we are now apologizing for. As another example, many people thought the war on terror that started after 
seemed like a reasonable plan. But people lost their interest in that interpretation when the death toll globally has now exceeded 500,000 civilians. As another example, the US, you may recall, led a boycott of the 1980 Moscow Olympics as a protest against the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. Of course, 22 years later, the U.S. decided invading Afghanistan wasn't actually such a bad idea, and they did it themselves. The point is, what we see, what we perceive in the present, is not always what we will see when we look back later. I think the evidence is there. It's hard for us to unequivocally separate good from evil in the present. I mean, this happens on a personal level, too. I've heard countless stories where people were devastated because of a job loss, for example. Losing a job is considered bad, right? But there's so many cases where job loss led to development of new skills and actually a much better professional life down the road. And personally, I've spoken with many people in prison who actually grew out of the experience of incarceration and became more caring people, in part because of their experiences of incarceration. I mean, going to prison is considered bad, right? But even that can lead to new life. What appears to be bad today may be seen as good when we look back tomorrow. Unfortunately, what appears to be good today may be seen as bad when we look back tomorrow. And it's not just that our perceptions change over time. Good and evil coexist in the present anyway. Carl Jung's view of the human psyche was that we both hold, sorry, we hold both good and evil natures inside ourselves. He went on to explain that the good generally resides in our conscious minds, and our evil generally resides in our shadow, our unconscious dark side. Jung's theory, which may not be right, but it does explain maybe why it's so hard to eliminate racism. Because our conscious selves know that racism is moronic, but our unconscious selves react to the other in our midst, and we act out on our own racist impulses. If you try to separate your conscious and your unconscious selves, you will not be a whole person. But it's vital we are able to name, even if we can't separate, the good and the evil inside ourselves. We just need to do that with a lot of humility. It's perhaps a bit like what we used to call dealing with garbage. We used to take out the garbage, do you remember, a long time ago? Now we have to separate garbage. We separate it into trash, recycling, and compost. The effort of sorting through our own garbage makes us more aware of what we're actually doing. To quote Blooming Cactus again, Quote, just as we are learning to recycle and compost, so trash isn't such a big problem. Examining our shadow side is healthier than trying to pitch our sins in a one big garbage bag. Perhaps this trash and recycling metaphor is a modern translation of the parable of wheat and weeds. Whether we are talking about weeds or garbage, it is a caution that our quest for purity can lead to wrong ends when we ignore our own evil within. End quote. So if you've been sleeping up to now, now's the time to wake up because we're going to bring this into the present. As we move along in life, many things happen to us that we like, things that build us up, strengthen us, comfort us. And for most of us, many things happen as well that we do not like. Many experiences we have cause us pain or loss or confusion or fear. And sometimes we want to weed out these painful experiences, to grab it by the roots and rip it out, believing if we could just get rid of that evil thing, our lives would be better again. That's, of course, a very natural reaction to things in our lives that cause us pain and suffering. But we cannot rip out parts of our lives without at the same time denying our whole selves, our stories, our reality. The good and evil grow together, just as the wheat and the weeds do in the parable. What you might think of as weeds in your own life, I think of, I'd like to think of it this way, that those weeds in my own life 
It's kind of like family members that you don't really like. It's not really a question of how do you get rid of them. It's a question how do we live with them. Weeds, by definition, are not edible. But here's the good news. They can still be gifts. We need to learn to see weeds in our own lives as gifts. And the gift of the weed is that we can learn from them. We can all learn from the weeds in our own lives. For example, when we experience loss, we can learn what, it is, what is it that's deeply important to us. When we experience fear, we can learn how important it is to comfort and support others. When we experience loneliness, we can learn how important it is to befriend other people. The particular weed today, called the isolation from the pandemic, is helping many people today realize what it is that they truly value in life. And that is a gift. That knowledge is a gift. We can learn a lot from the weeds in our lives. And then once we have learned all that we can from those weeds, then we can leave those weeds alone to die in God's time, knowing that those weeds have no power over us. And so they can sit there, it's fine, and they will not cause us more pain. Unless you actually do live in the land of Oz, you will find that good and evil are mixed together in our society, in our churches, in our own hearts. But the evil, like weeds, are opportunities for us to grow as long as we are honest about them. That's the key. We recently concluded some discussion groups called Let's Talk About Racism, where people brought their whole selves and named how the weed of racism impacted them personally. Naming those weeds in our lives is like sorting the trash. It does take some effort. It might stink a bit. But in the end, we find we are more at peace with ourselves. The weeds in our lives are gifts. Open your heart to learn what you can from the weeds in your own life, and then leave those weeds to die in God's time. Amen. Oh, oh, oh.
many ways that we contribute to the life and work of being the church. And that doesn't change in, in these uncertain times. And so as we, as we listen to this musical offering, let us reflect on the places that we can continue to support the life and work of our congregations. Um, I believe there's a slide. We, we, did, we didn't get the Sydenham Heritage sort of information, but um, hopefully maybe someone on Twitch could, could, um, could share that with you. present our, our various gifts and offerings, 
and talents. May each of us be a part of your answer to the cries of the world. Amen. And so now we move into a time of caring and sharing, of, of, sharing the joys and concerns. of sharing the joys and concerns of our lives. Um, first, uh, again, an apology about that offering slide. That was an oversight um, that uh, we'll remedy for next week to include uh, Sydenham Heritage's information. Uh, another piece that I'm aware as, as we're... Um, recording and whatnot, um, we did not get the Zoom coffee hours for each congregation into the PowerPoint. And so um, I would ask someone from Fairview, if you don't mind, just copy and pasting that into the Facebook Live comments, and uh, maybe someone from Sydenham Heritage could post the, uh, that information uh, on Twitch for you folks. I understand ours may be on there, in which case, apologies again to Sydenham Heritage. We will fix that for next week. And so um, I wanted to share one celebration that I'm aware of that uh, came up at a, a meeting earlier this week um, for some folks in, in the Fairview congregation who would be aware that uh, we received a grant to help connect uh, folks in, in our, our community um, with technology, specifically seniors and technology. And, and with some of that grant, we acquired five iPads. And, and for the past month, those iPads have been, um, been used by, by folks to, um, to connect with us, to connect with each other. And uh, we heard a, a couple of, um, of really, really nice stories at, at that meeting about how how some of that technology, and so I lift that, that up as a celebration, the, the ability to use technology to connect and be connected at this time, um, and uh, the technology that allows us to gather in a bigger community through this summer as we, we join the two congregations. Um, other um, celebrations and concerns, I know, um, I don't know if you wanted to, to just Say a, a, a brief word about. Yes, I just wanted to tell you that my mom, um, Dorothy Bain, is having a really difficult time right now. And if you could keep her and her very dear friend, Marilyn, in your thoughts and prayers, that would be wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, we hold Dorothy and, and Marilyn and, and Cindy and, and, and Deborah and, and all those who are um, providing care at this time. And so... Um, let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we give thanks for many blessings of life, for the ability to be connected in these, these uncertain times, the ability to use technology in creative ways. We give thanks for family and friends, for loved ones and those who share our lives and, and bring us joy. We give thanks for the 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 um, spirit of, of summer as we um, have the ability to, to be outside more, uh, for those who are gardening and, and bringing forth life from the earth. We recognize that there are many things for which we give thanks, but that as we enter into a space of worship, we come with our whole selves, complete with worries and anxieties sorrows that we carry with us. And so we lift up the prayers of our hearts. We lift up Dorothy Bain and Marilyn and Cindy and Deborah and, and their sisters as, as they provide care for Dorothy. We lift up those we know who are ill, those who are grieving, while some restrictions are, are lifting, it's a complicated time to be dealing with grief. And so we lift up the prayers of our hearts, those that we voiced aloud and those we carry too deep for words. Perhaps some have been mentioned in the comments. And so we lift up those prayers as we turn to Words that Jesus taught his disciples to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And so let us join in our closing hymn for the healing of the nations. So as we go forth into our day, may we go with the grace and peace of God, which surpasses all our understanding, keeping watch over our hearts and minds now and always. Amen. Go make a difference. We can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. Go make a difference. We can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. Go make a difference. We can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. Go make a difference. We can make a difference.